For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. spiritually dead, and because of that, separated from God, our first ideas that we build into our life are worldly, self, self-important, self-focused ideas, self-serving. When we're born again into the Christian life, spiritually alive, Christ-centered and Christ-serving, we're entered into this transformation process that Paul talks in Romans 12 And that's about growth, spiritual growth. And the goal of this spiritual growth is to get to this place of maturity. And it's all over the New Testament to get to this place of maturity. And we've been discussing it uh, in a, if you've not been hearing these lessons, you've got to be hearing these lessons out of 2 Corinthians about reaching this place of maturity, these stages of growth. And you get to this place of maturity and you have a new way of thinking in Christ and a new way of approaching your life. And one of the great things that happens is you're freed up from that which is natural in your sin nature and you're freed up to embrace all the Bible talks about as far as loving others. You're actually able to to do more than just talk about it. It becomes the reality of your life. It's the feeling that begins to build inside of you. It's the desire that you have, the mindset that you have toward your mate, toward your neighbor, even toward your enemies. Now, this word maturity is the word teleos and It has different meanings. All words in the New Testament have different meanings. In fact, you may not realize this, but all the the words in the Bible started out as secular words. I mean, these were just normal words. And the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament just took these normal words to describe the Christian experience, the Christian life. They took normal words that, that described a daily life Agape love was one of those words. It was just a, it was a rare word. I found a, you know, I keep searching the internet for different things, and I kept looking, I keep searching, and I found a new thing that said this word was very rare, hardly used. Don't know if that's true, but makes sense. But the word agape was a word that was used in the daily life of the Greek culture. It's not a, it's not a Bible word. But the writers of the scriptures turned it into a Bible word, and it's a big, important word. But this word teleos means to be complete or fulfilled, to be finished. When Jesus said in uh, John 19.30, tetelestai, it is finished. He uses that word. He's, He's finished paying for the sins of the world. He talks about John 17, 4, when he prays, he said, Father, I've finished the work that you gave me to do. James chapter 1, verse 4 talks about this word, uh, uh, completing, let endurance have its completed work uh, impacting your life and your growth spiritually. It also means to be perfect like God, to be perfect positionally, not going to get there in this life, but. And finally, the word means to be mature. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 through 18, it talks about mature love. And that's my idea today, is mature love. Unconditional love is a ministry of the Spirit. It's just part of the Spirit's work in your life. But as you mature as a believer... That love grows stronger, it grows more discerning, it grows wiser, 
where you literally over time have been able to lay aside your own selfish ideas, selfish ambitions. You know, when people first get married, they normally have ideas about what they're going to get from the relationship. It's why they get married. They get married to get something that they don't have in their life. And that's a legitimate thing. As you grow in it, you finally realize at a point that it's not about getting, that it's about giving. But this is a mature look. This is a mature understanding that the more you try to get, the less you actually receive. And the more you give, the more it produces for both of you. But you have to be able to have a mindset of maturity to not only see that, but to do that in reality. A lot of words used, but there's a few in my experience that actually reach a place where that is their life, where it's reality. Easy to learn a lot of principles, but it's not so easy to put them into practice in life. And that's the real goal. Maturity frees us from our selfish motives, enabling us to surrender to the Spirit consistently. Consistently. Listen, you, it's, we can surrender to the Spirit every now and then and be walk in the Spirit, but listen, to be there consistently, constantly, to not get out of fellowship for days at a time. Now, a young believer would say, hey, that's not possible. If you understand sin, if you understand mental and verbal and overt sins, if you know mental sins and you count those as sins, worry, fear, anxiety, anger, bitterness, jealousy, those types of things are the worst sins. We don't see them so much, but they are, they're, the, they're the root and motivation of all other sins. But if you count the mental sins, you're in and out of fellowship consistently. Maturity is a place you reach where you begin to stay in fellowship. You have more time, more enjoyment of being in fellowship with God than you do being out. You'd rather stay there with Him than be out of fellowship with Him. So we're free from selfishness and we're able to surrender to the Spirit consistently giving us the capacity to obey these supernatural commands like husband love, husbands love your wife, like Christ loved the church. I mean, is that a pretty high calling? Pretty high standard, isn't it? Like Christ loved the church? How about count it all joy when all the adversities of the world pile in on you? Hooray! about be grateful for all things at all times. Those are pretty high standards. Now, most of the Christian world treats those as some distant goal that you'll never get to. It's, not, it's like hyperbole. You know what hyperbole is? It means you're exaggerating something that's not, re it's not really real. It's not really real that you could be grateful for all things at all times. It's because you've never gotten to that state of maturity in your life where that's, that's your, that, that what God is doing in your life you see as good, and that is your reality. You can get to that place where that is the reality of your life, and you really and truly are grateful for everything that happens. That's maturity. That's when this stuff starts to work, folks. So, I encourage you to continue growing spiritually. And many of you are mature and uh, adult Christians and don't even realize it, but that's probably good. Maturity is the status of soul where your life begins to resemble the biblical descri description of what a Christian is supposed to be like. I remember years ago, I started to, I would, had jobs where I went to people's homes and I would come in and meet them in their homes and sell them stuff. And 
they begin to say, Are you, you're a Christian, right? I mean, they begin to see something was different about me, and I thought, well, hmm, maybe something is happening. The first goal of the Christian life is to become a mature man like Ephesians 4.13. If you'll read that with me, Ephesians 4.13, Ron just studied that. It's just such an important concept. He's talking about the gifts given to the church in verse 11, Ephesians 4.11. And in verse 12, he's talking about the ministry to the church for the training and equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry to the building up of the body of Christ. And in 13, he says, until. And so what you see with this word until is this, this gap, this time of growth until we all arrive uh, at the unity of the faith where we're, we're unified in what we believe. We're unified not just because we've stopped talking about the hard issues. I grew up in a church where you didn't t- you didn't discuss the hard issues. You just left it all alone. You know, don't get into the Bible because it has some hard issues, and it makes people disagree. So let's just be social, and 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 be nice to each other, and we call that love. But the Bible says we're to reach a unity in our in our beliefs about the Word of God unto the full knowledge of the Son of God, unto a mature man. And he explains this is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ himself. So, point being, as we begin to study love, maturity is where this starts to work. Maturity is where this gets real. Where you really can love your wife on a consistent basis the right way. And we'll talk about what that means. So unconditional love powered by the Spirit is available at every stage of growth, but it is in the adult and mature stages that unconditional love becomes a fixed and determined commitment to edify All mankind, not only those close to you, but everybody. It's a fixed and determined commitment. And that includes yourself. That includes yourself. The ability to forgive yourself for what you think are your own failures. Let me ask you a question. For those of you who are having trouble forgiving yourself, Do you think God knows how you should be treated? Do you think? He knows, right? What does he do with all your sins? He paid for them. And when you confess them to him, what does he do? He forgives them. As far as the east is from the west. So, does he keep ragging you about him? Does he keep, once you've confessed, does he keep bringing it up? Does he give you the look? Is he giving you the look? Is he down on you or is he wanting you to have guilt and shame? Not at all. I used to do that to myself. And as I began to grow and have a relationship with him, he told me, he said, son, I really, I really need you to quit that. He said, you think that somehow that's going to produce something good, this shaming yourself, guilting yourself. You're going to get something good out of that. It's going to motivate you to quit doing bad things. He said, it'll never work. All it's going to do is make you miserable. Now stop beating yourself up. You're my child, and I'm not going to let you beat yourself up. Treat yourself the same way I do. Because I know how you should be treated. And you should be forgiven. You should be loved. You should be given uh, a million chances. Every time you fail, you get back up a million times and a million times a million times. Right? Right. Now, 
words, words and phrases in the Bible come from the language of the day. Just like our language is our language. And there's words that Paul especially was smart enough to create. He made them up. Something I love to do is make up words. It drives my family crazy, but especially texting people, you know. I text some crazy things, but anyway, just another little thing to share with you. The word agape, which is going to be our word for today, is a word that was used in the culture of the time. And I'm not going to take you to all those places. I don't think I might be able to do that, but... The point being that these are words that were used to describe the actions of unbelievers. Turn to John chapter 3, and I'll show you one. John chapter 3. Y'all, everybody knows John 3.16. John 3.16. Now, for those of us who believe that agape love is some kind of special love, I need you to realize that in verse 16 it says, God so loved the world, and that's our word agape. It's the verb agapao. God so loved the world. All right? If you'll look down at verse 19, he said, And this is the judgment that light has come into the world, but... Men loved darkness rather than light. What do you think the word men loved darkness is? Same word. God so loved the world, agape, agapao, and men loved darkness, agapao. So men loving darkness is not this special Christian love word, is it? Here's what you need to understand about that, is that the word had its own meaning. The writers of Scripture borrowed it, especially John and Paul borrowed this word out of their, out of their normal usage and turned it into something with special meaning. But the word had a meaning of its own before it was turned into Christian love. And that's what I think it's important for us to understand, and I'm going to try to develop that for you. Now, the ancient Greeks, we're going to talk about this love now in the husband's role. I, I taught this at the marriage conference, but I was ill, and I didn't get to this part. And somebody pointed out to me the other day that I had spent all the time on the ladies and their submission, and I had just completely left the men out. So I decided that that was fair, and when I had the chance, I was going to include the men. So... This is for you, gentlemen. Actually, it's for you, ladies, but uh, let's get on to them a while. The ancient Greeks, who were great human thinkers, distinguished four categories of love. C.S. Lewis has a book about this, and you can even, I think on YouTube, you can hear C.S. Lewis talking about this. Believe me, he's deep. Uh, these four categories of love that most of us experience in our life, these four types of love have a place in marriage and family life. Uh, all are important, but all are not the same importance. And so we're going to study and define each type of love and discuss how they apply in marriage. Our primary point today is going to be that unconditional love is the committed love that gives victory in every stage and through every struggle of marriage. Unconditional love is more important than any other kind of love. The other kinds of love come and go. They come and go. This one is the one that's fixed and determined. It's a mindset. Now, the first word is storge. It's a familial love. And it, it's often translated, it's in the Bible, in the negative in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy, yeah, uh, chapter 3, yeah, it's uh, in Romans 131. It's, it's translated natural affection. 
It's found only in the negative. It means a family love, a love for your brother and your sister. There's a love that comes with blood. It just is the, it's just a blood love. It's just a love for your family, those that, that are, are your brothers and sisters, your parents, your siblings, your children. There's just a natural connection to your family. And that's this storge love. There's a natural affection and loyalty one has for family members. Now, this starts, of course, with parents and children, and their love that the parents have for children goes into the children, and the children have for each other, and then one day they have their own children, and then they become teenagers, and that love goes away for a while, and but it comes back. Oh, just kidding, girls. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Somebody's not kidding. As we separate from parents, we form these, this love in a different way. But there's a commitment that remains with your brothers and sisters, with your family that runs all the way through life. I have two brothers left living that could call me at any time and I would get on my horse and ride. No questions asked, just get on my horse and ride. If they need a place to stay and that place to live, my home's open. That's just, of course, that's, that's true of you too. I guess, honey. <laughs> Come on over. We had a whole house full this weekend, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Of course, Rhonda did all the work, and that was the way I liked it. But <sighs> Genesis 2.24, for this cause... Marriage, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There's a familial, they become family. Part of God's human provision for, our, uh, for us is our need to belong. This is fulfilled in our royal family of God uh, package. Now, the second kind of love that we want to discuss today is, is romantic love. This is eros, and that's where you get your word erotic. Uh, and this is a, a romantic love, a sexual kind of love, a hormonal love. You didn't know there was a hormonal. It, it can even be Hollywood love. Hollywood movie love is really fun to watch, you know. It happens really quickly. Because movies only usually have like an hour and a half, so uh, it give, you make you know what I mean. It, it, ha it happens quick. Uh, but Eros was the god of love, and Cupid's boss. So Cupid, uh, Eros would send Cupid down to smite people, and cause all kind of trouble in their life. When psychology got a hold of this love, it called it a libido or sexual drive. Uh, it's a mating instinct. Our dear Sylvia one time said it's a trick. <laughs> it's a trick to get you married and propagate the species. Yeah, it's a trick because it's not marriage is not what you think. It's a trick. Uh, so. It's a pleasure drive, and it's God-given. It's a right thing in marriage. It's a wonderful thing. It's an important thing. It's designed for pleasure. It's used for procreation. In Genesis 2.25, and the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Adam, hey, God brought her to Adam, and he went, let's rock and roll. Something along that line. In, in relationships, it's part of the initial attraction that leads to courtship. It's a sexual attraction. There must be some kind of uh, sexual attraction between two people for there to end up being uh, a good marriage. If you're dating someone and you're not attracted to them at all, then... 
then I, then if, and you're a teenager, then you need to stick with them for just a little while. Oh, uh, but. It's a wonderful part of marriage. It's an important part of oneness. This romantic, erotic love, this eros, it's, it stays throughout. It stays throughout. But it's, listen, it's inconsistent. It's not something you can base a relationship on. Many people try to do that, and the movies try to present that that's the basis of relationship, that you can sustain this erotic love over the, over the centuries, you know, that you can, it'll reach into the grave and pull somebody out, you know. It's just silly stuff, but uh, it's based on hormones. Uh, it has to do with tranquility in your life, time and opportunity, all kinds of things. You know, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. So if you're not around your partner, your mate, absence makes the heart grow fonder for whoever you're around. So remember that. Just to no extra charge for that one. Just in in uh, 1 Corinthians seven, chapter seven, verse three through five, he's talking about sexual connection, and he's talking about. Uh, a man and woman shouldn't connect up sexually while they're single. Man shouldn't build a fire under a woman. Hopto means to build a fire. But once you're married, he says you should build a fire all the time. Just build a bonfire. Uh, is that funny? Yeah, I guess it was, huh? Bonfire. Be responsible for each other's sexual needs. Sexual love is not good at problem solving or problem, it creates problems. It is, a, can be a problem. Men and women are very different in the way they think about sex. And we have a tendency to, we're very egocentric. Egocentric means you think the way you see things is how everybody sees things. Egocentric, it doesn't mean you're selfish. It means you, the way you look at something, you think everybody looks at it that way. So a man is thinking sex in one way, and a woman is thinking sex in a different way, and he's thinking, why, don't you, why aren't you thinking about it my way? And she's like, if you could have this conversation, but it doesn't really work well. If she, could, if she could see into your brain and understand what you were thinking and seeing in your mind, she would probably just run. But uh, she would be like, you've got to be kidding me. But you see it differently. So it's very difficult to bring that together, and it creates problems. It creates problems. So the third kind of love, and we'll get to the solving of the problems, the third kind of love is friendship love. Philos, or phileo. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This is a compatibility love, and it's important that we understand the distinction between friendship love and unconditional love, because this is where you're going to get your understanding of the word. Friendship love, philos, is a compatibility love. It, it's an affection that you have for someone with whom you share common ground. Uh, it can be admiration. It can be enjoyment. It can be a loyalty. But listen, it's very discriminating. In other words, it, it's not for everybody. I mean, who, who in your life do you truly, really love to be around? I mean, just not, not spiritually, not just in a friendship way. You just really enjoy being around. And listen, this can be based on anything. Years ago, I went to work for Cook's Pest Control, and there was a guy in there named Terry Melton that loved to kill bugs. He, was, he loved it. And I, I, I got teamed up with him the first time, month I was there, 
and he gave me the same love of, and so we would work all day and then work all night in restaurants so we could kill bugs, and we loved doing it together. And it was, I mean, he was my buddy. I mean, but that was it. He wasn't saved. He wasn't spiritual. He wasn't interested in anything else. But what we did together well was kill. We were some killers. I mean, we did a lot of killing. But we, that was our compatibility. This is not something. I worked with other people there. I didn't have the same connection with them that I did with Terry. I don't know why. I'm not sure how that works. But this love is very conditional. In other words, it's dependent on what you get back. You give to get back. You love to be loved. This is a normal kind of love that humans do all the time. We give something expecting to be given back. We love, we nurture, we're positive, we praise, we flatter, whatever, expecting to get a return. Expecting to get a return. This is another thing that has to be watched out for in marriage because this one doesn't work well all the time either. If you can get this one going, though, then you got something good. If you got the last two. But friendship in marriage, including laughter, common interest, if that works for you, enjoyment of different things, find, finding things that you enjoy doing together. Uh, that may be a challenge for some because of incompatibilities of personality and all. But friendship is a very important to develop. Uh, it's, it's what leads to this uh, personal partnership, the working together for common goals like raising children is what helps form this over time. You work together, you have the same goals, you have the same problems, you have the same issues, and you're working together, forming a partnership and a friendship in dealing with these things. And listen, listen, part of the reason you have problems in your life, God has allowed them so that you can learn to work together with your partner. Hello. It forces you. Forces you to work together. Or just explode, come apart. But compatibility is the key to this. You, you, you find something in common that you enjoy with the other person. You work together. It's developed over time when you work together in shared experiences. Now, all of the above loves, the Family love, the romantic love, and the friendship love are conditional loves. They're dependent upon reciprocation, getting something back. I mean, if you keep uh, promoting friendship to someone, friendship to someone, and they never return, you want you invite them out to dinner or whatever or to play golf or whatever it is you like to do, you know, build model airplanes or whatever, and they never want to go with you, what does that tell you? Your giving is not getting anything back. So you're going to move on to someone else to find that kind of give and take with. That's just normal, and that's natural. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing to have a friend. Everybody needs a friend. But all of these are dependent on return, reciprocation, on circumstances, and on how the relationship is working. None of these are sufficient to achieve God's objective for your marriage. And listen, none of these will keep your marriage tight and healthy. They're, they're not designed for that. Now, we get to the end of this, we're going to talk about committed love or unconditional love. The word agape, you have to figure out what the word means. Trying to understand what the word means in its secular usage. I didn't write these down. I can't believe I didn't write them down, but 
For instance, he said that the Pharisees agape the chief seats in the synagogue. They loved them. The men loved darkness. Jesus said that some of the religious people loved the praises of men. They loved it. Now, to try to understand this word, I mean, there's things in your life that you love. I mean, it could be a car. I grew up with a fella. His name was Robin Murray. If you're you're out there, Robin, give me a call. Uh, His dad loved his cars in a way that I've never seen anybody. I mean, he... He kept them shined up. He shined them up every day, inside out. I mean, he checked the tire pressure before he go to work every morning. You know, he'd just check everything out, check the oil. I mean, he loved his car. He was committed to that car. He was committed to do whatever that car needed to make it what it needed to be, to make it perfect. You understand that? When he loved it, he was committed to do what was good for it. Oh, uh, we, we got a dog at the house that is the most entertaining dog I've ever been around. Uh, we used to have a backyard. We used to have grass in the backyard. Not anymore. We have trails. Uh, we have a little bit of grass left, but it's not going to last through the, to the spring. It won't be, it won't be there. Uh, but... We kind of like this dog. We're really committed to this dog. Uh, I grew up with dogs. My my dad was a farm boy like you, and everything had a purpose. And if we ended up with a dog that wouldn't obey him, you know, animals obeyed him. In fact, everybody obeyed him. But if the animal would not obey him, do you know what happened to it? I'm not sure what happened to it. Because it didn't, it wasn't there when I got home from school. Uh, this dog gets out in the front and runs, and you can't catch it, and it won't come to you till it's ready. Now it's a good thing Dad's not alive, or that dog would be dead. I mean, but we love that dog. We're committed to that dog. Zach goes and gets him pills and all kinds of stuff. That's Committed. That's agape love. We're committed to it. Uh, You follow that? That's what that love means. It means to be committed to do whatever is best for that person, that animal, that thing that you love. And the word has the connotation in that sense of being committed to something. To adopt a mindset that says, I will do only good to you. Every decision that I make considers what is best for you or what is not best for you. And every decision that I make in our relationship is based on what is good for you. I am committed to your welfare. I am committed to to your spiritual growth, I am committed. I am sold out to you and what you need. That's the idea. This is to what we're to be to one another. Sold out all the way, 100%. Listen, we're to love the Lord our God with what? All our soul, all our heart, all our mind. Listen, everything. Surrendered, sold out. Boom, it's yours. I'm yours. Every breath, every effort, everything that I do is about this commitment I have to do what is good for you, God. To do what is good for you, Rhonda. To do what is good for you, fellow believers. Would I harm you? Not in my right mind possible catch me at the right moment i might bite on you a little bit 
I don't have many teeth left, so it wouldn't hurt too bad. But uh, the word, the idea is that I am, I have decided, I have concluded, I have committed myself to be a benefit, a a helper, an edifier, a giver to you, and nothing, nothing more. I need nothing back to do that. You don't have to feed that in the person who's loving, giving this kind of, you don't feed that, it comes from God. God feeds it. We'll, we'll close, turn to Romans 5.5 5 and I'll show you and we'll close and go have a break. Romans 5.5. 5. This love comes from God. He teaches you how to do it, how to think this way by giving it to you. He's talking about hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. And that word poured out is in the perfect tense. And the perfect tense indicates all of the love that God is going to give us, which is all the love that God has, has already been poured out completely and totally. It's a, it's a finished state. Finished. There's no more love in God to pour out into you. It's already poured out and it's in you. And the idea is that as you mature and you learn to interact with God's love and, and that becomes your reality, that love begins to overflow. It goes in you and fills you up. And as you get fill, fuller and fuller of God's care and love and attention and future and hope and confidence, it overflows out of you and goes to others. That's how you become a, that's how living waters come out of you to go and nourish others. That's this love. Let's close now for the half. We'll take a break. We'll have the offering and take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back and finish up our study. Anything you got, Ron? All right. Marion, pray for us on the offering, please. Father, we thank you for this lesson. Thank you for this time. We have the opportunity to give back in the motivations that God puts within us. Father, we thank you for this time and ask that it's all stand according to your plan and your glory. Amen.
We're in the discussion of unconditional love, the word agape, and its standard use means to be committed to something, to be devoted to it, to place it as an object in your life of such importance uh, that you'll do whatever you can to nourish it, to nurture it, to take care of it, to benefit it, uh, whatever it happens to be. It can be a car, it can be a person, uh, your house. I mean, some people do that with their yard. I mean, they're just meticulous with taking care of their yard, and uh, they love their yard. And that's the idea here is, and, and I don't want you to think that Christian love is as trivial as loving your yard. It's not the same. It's just the idea of the commitment to do whatever is good or best for the other. <clears throat> so we have an unconditional commitment to the benevolent benefit of others. And it's a mindset. In other words, it's a, it's a, it's, it can be emotion. It, it will include emotion, but it's not emotional. It's not, ooh, you know, it's not that syrupy stuff. That it's, it's, a, it's a thought. It's a number of thoughts that form together to give you a conclusion and a mindset. It's unconditional because it never depends on the character or the behavior of the person who receives it, the person that you're giving it to. It doesn't matter what they do. If they reject you, you're still going to give. Uh, if they won't let you near them, you're still going to be willing and ready to give. Sometimes this love is going to be very aggressive. It's going to reach out and touch. It's going to say, I need to, I need to intervene. Sometimes this love is going to be discerning and say, I need, to, I need to back off. I need to let this person be. I need to wait on this person to be more ready. Love is the, is the manager, if you will, of truth. Love, love looks at the other person and decides what to do with truth. If that's to give it, to push it, to back off, love does that. It has that discernment. The Spirit will give you that. Now, when I say it's a commitment, it means I say it's a policy. It's a policy. Listen, it is my policy. I don't always live up, but it is my policy to do harm to no one. No one. I do harm to no one. It is my policy to do whatever I can to whatever extent that I can to edify whoever God puts in my path at any time of my day. To whatever extent that they will allow, whatever they will listen and hear. Of course, my way of helping is to explain. You know, I'm like Lucy. I got explaining to do. I'm a splainer. So, but it's a policy, and that means it's a policy in your life that says, I don't harm people. I don't harm anything. Now, the benevolent idea means you avoid all malice, you avoid all vengeance, all payback. There is no such. You do only good and never harm. You benefit the other, and that is primarily spiritual as a husband. If you read Ephesians 5, turn to Ephesians 5 with me. Let's read this language right quick to help you understand the husband's job. <clears throat> Paul, who was... Who was Occupy with Christ, who thought mostly he wasn't married. He thought mostly all about Christ. His Christ was his husband. He was the leader in his life. He's talking about Christ as husbands and wives uh, represent and vision and, and give us an image of Christ. Husbands, verse five, chapter five, verse twenty-five. Husband loves your wives just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, uh, but that she should be holy and blameless. Now, 
There's no way for a husband to present his wife holy and blameless and spotless before the Lord. Right? I can't present, I'm not going to be presenting Rhonda to the Lord. But the Lord is. The idea is that the Lord is working for your spiritual benefit every moment of your life. The Holy Spirit is working inside of you. The Lord is working out as the, as the leader of the church they're after your spiritual benefit every second of your existence. There's no moment of your existence that the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father are not working for your spiritual growth and benefit. That's the husband's job. It's the husband's job. His every decision is based on what is spiritually beneficial for my wife. Spiritually beneficial. That may include any other part of life, but it is primarily the spiritual life, you know. And look, I've heard the idea that the husband is the spiritual leader. Okay. However you want to interpret that, I do know that the leader is the person who goes first. The leader is the person who is the example. If you want to say the husband is that, I'm with you. If you want to say that the husband should boss his wife around about her spiritual life, I'm probably going to disagree with you on that. So. Unconditional love creates an environment of grace and forgiveness. And in doing so, it stabilizes the relationship. Listen, it is not romance that keeps marriage together and keeps marriage on the right track it is forgiveness the thing that makes marriage workable is forgiveness because being the sinners that we are the struggles that we have in our own life the inconsistencies that we have at times even as a mature christian you have struggles you have times when you're up and times when you're down Times when you're being defeated, times when you're not doing well. This is all of us, and we just struggle through it, and we keep moving and keep moving and keep moving, and that's how you win spiritually. You keep on going, and God, and God never gives up on you, and you never quit either. See, 1 Corinthians 13, love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It means love keeps believing that you can do it. It keeps hoping, expecting that you're going to reach the spiritual goal. It keeps enduring everything that's happening in the environment and even from you. It just hangs in there, hoping for you, believing in you, believing for you. Just keeps on going, keeps on giving, keeps on giving, keeps on giving. It's a policy in your life that says, this is how I treat others. Okay? And once you get to that point, where you see that that is what God wants from you and you're willing to give that. Because in order to be that, you have to give up your selfishness. You have to give up the idea that you owe me. You owe me. You took vows. Listen, reminding of your wife that she took vows is a really effective way of getting her to love you, isn't it? That work well, ladies? You like that? Nope. Doesn't work too well. But grace and forgiveness. Unconditional love allows your mate to fail and recover without fear of losing the relationship. Listen, it also, wow, this is so important. It also allows your mate Time to process. This is something we've learned. I've learned to tell each other. You, you walk away and you think, well, you're withdrawing. You're withdrawing from the relationship instead of staying to work it out. And the answer is no, I need a moment to process. I need to think this through. You got to give me some time to make my own adjustments and then I'll be back and we'll work this out. See, love says, you got it. Love is for whatever makes the relationship better. Selfishness says, no, 
I want now. Now is for me. It's all about me, 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 me. What about me? So that you can you could fail. And listen, this is for both of you. When you stop letting your mate fail and recover, and you won't forgive, you start holding. You, you're adding the score. You go, how many times is, am I going to have to let this guy recover? How many times? When you quit forgiving and you, let, and you start keeping score and you start remembering you're headed for a fall, you become a judge, and you withhold your heart because you think it's not safe when your safety's really in the Lord. And you're not gonna, your marriage is going to suffer for it. And that person's going to suffer for it because they feel your judgment. They feel you judging them. You've got to forgive. Lest you too. See, your self-righteousness and judgment is just as sinful and just as harmful and hurtful as whatever sin they're in. You've got to forgive, folks. Forgiveness is the key to this whole thing. So... The Bible commands all believers to practice unconditional love toward everyone, including your fellow believers, including your enemies, including the world, the people, liberals. I mean, I, that might be the one exception. I don't know. But. Unconditional love makes marriage an environment where the, where the other types of love can flourish. Listen, you're safe. You're safe to give yourself romantically. You're safe to open yourself up in friendship and let yourself be seen and let yourself be known so that you don't have to be pretend that you're strong all the time. You can be for real. If Christianity is anything, it's about being real. And the idea that we're supposed to be strong all the time and appear strong all the time is, a, is hogwash. It is, it is called self-protection. It is from the devil. Now, there's, a, there's a measure of wisdom involved in all relationships, but the openness, unconditional love creates an environment that says you can fail and, and your failures can be known and nobody's going to throw any stones at you. Nobody's going to judge you because lest it be me tomorrow. Now, that's truth. That's reality. But look, to get there, you got to get over yourself. you got to be able to lay aside the ideas in yourself that judge others and compare with others. So... Unconditional love requires that we consider a relationship with God more important than our relationship with our mate. Intimacy with God provides the spiritual, mental, and emotional needs of the individual and frees us from needing people to meet your needs. This is so important. Listen. We come into life needy. Look, we come into life separated from God. Needing. We're needy. Everybody is. We're made that way. So we don't have God to attach ourselves to, so we attach to people. And people become our source of love. And we believe in that. And we grow up until the day that you understand the difference. You grow up thinking that, that love with a person is the answer for your life. It's what we all do. One day you've got to understand that that's not true. You gotta you gotta switch that, you gotta unplug that from a person and plug it back into God to meet your personal emotional needs, your relational needs. For that to happen, listen, for most people that hear that, that is the most ridiculous thing. They're like, how could that ever be? That God's not real enough in my life for me to even get close to that. Maturity is the place where that begins to happen. God is real enough to meet your own personal needs. When that happens, 
Now you can give because you don't need. You're not all needy. That's, thank you, God, for being able to get free of being needy all the time. Needy on a mate. Our sufficiency in Christ allows us to give to others the room they need to grow. It allows us to stay positive. So let's look at a few things. First, a wife is equally worthy of God's love as her husband. But this equal worthiness is not, re- not just the reason why he is to love her this way. He is required to honor her as a co-heir of the grace of life because she is co-equal in every way. Galatians 3.28 says there's no racial, gender, economic distinctions of any kind in Christ. We're all the same. We're all equally lost before salvation. We're all equally sinful in our different ways. We're all equally worthless. We're all equal in every way. And listen, when you get saved, you're all equally saved. You're all equally in Christ. You're all equally have the assets. You're, you, you have everything equally the way God set it up, and it depends on what you do with it. The husband's mindset of unconditional love is focused on the wife's spiritual benefit. That's the simplicity for me. What am I to do? How am I to treat my wife? How am I to think about her? What does it mean to love her like Christ loved the church? What does that mean? Tell me what to do. Well, grow spiritually till you reach maturity. (laughs) Plug everything into God. Let God meet your needs completely and totally, and then you'll be ready to give to your wife, right? No, you do it all along the way. But as you get stronger and more focused on the Lord, and the Lord becomes more real to you, your loyalty to him, listen, you love others because you're loyal to him. him. He says, this is how I want you to treat everybody. I want you to treat everybody this way, and as you continue to grow, you're going to be be a light. The way you treat everybody is going to stand out. You're going to be different. Everybody's going to see that you're a different kind of guy. They're going to see me in you because of the love you have for others. That's what Jesus prayed for in John 17, that our love for one another would be the reason why others believed that God sent him. They could see it in us. So, you focus on your wife's spiritual benefit. Or, listen, or your friend's spiritual benefit, or your neighbor's spiritual benefit, your boss, your co-worker, whoever you're in periphery with, You focus on their spiritual benefit and you say and do only what you believe under the discernment of the Spirit will benefit them spiritually. That's all you do. That's all you do. As you grow spiritually, your ability, capacity to do that will increase. The husband's love is focused on providing an environment of love in which she has her best opportunity to grow spiritually. He stops judging. He stops pushing. He stops criticizing. He lets her be. He lets her grow at her own pace, in her own way. When the husband is, is consistent in an unconditional love, it helps his wife develop the habit of using beliefs that enable her to submit to him. The husband's surrender to the Lord and his love for his wife helps her to surrender to the Lord and submit to him. If you're in Ephesians, I want you to look at chapter 5, verse 33. This is a really interesting passage. And I'm not sure that it's been dealt with properly. The husband in verse 33, he says, Nevertheless, let let each individual husband, and he goes through great pains to call the husband out individually. Uh, 
I mean, he uses some particles here, uh, a string of particles and conjunctions and all different types, um, like five of them in a row that you're like, they don't make, that doesn't make any sense. But he's really calling attention to this. And he says, Lead each husband, each individual one himself, love his wife. And he does it in, the, he gives you the imperative. Imperative is what? A command. Husband is commanded. Now, and the wife, so that she might respect her husband. Now, you would think that the husband gets the command to love and the wife gets the command to respect. Earlier on, she was given the command to submit, which, by the way, we don't understand what that word means. Maybe we'll talk about it, but she is given the word to respect in the subjunctive mood. And let me tell you that what that means. That means that when you say something in the subjunctive mood, it's something that's possible and something that's potential. In other words, it's something that can happen if she chooses to be respectful to uh, to cultivate a respect for him, if she chooses that, it will happen. It's the same thing as 1 John 1, 9 when he says, if you confess your sins, maybe you will, maybe you won't. It's possible. It's potential, right? That's the subjunctive. And so when he says, husbands, I command you to love your wife. And wife, based on his love, you have the potential to, be, to have respect for him. Here's what I think it means. The, the commentators tell you that that's a participle of command, and I'm sure that it is. I don't think the woman is getting away with not being coming under the command of God, but it's, it, the construction is so unique. He gives, a, he gives a subjunctive contingency. It's possible, it's probable, if you decide to do it, ladies. I believe what he's saying is that when the husband consistently practices unconditional love toward his wife, that it enables her to better and more readily and more easily respect him. Now, she is to respect him whether he's respectable or not. She's to submit to him if you know what that word means, whether he is respectable or not. That's the command to the lady. But I do believe what he's saying here is that the husband's success from his maturity to love his wife creates an environment that makes it easier and, and for her to be respect, to have respect for him. Husbands, you make your own bed and you got to lie in it. Okay? Now, wives have sin natures and they make their own choices and they react to your failures or don't and they, they're commanded to love you as a fellow believer if nothing else. But the emphasis here is on the man providing the environment of unconditional love, which is a commitment to do what is best for his wife spiritually. That means to not raise his voice. That means to, what are you getting angry about? What are you getting angry about? Why are you raising your voice? Why have you changed your tone? I mean, what is it that this lady owes you? What do you think she owes you guys? She don't owe you anything. She don't even have to stay with you. She stays because of the Lord. And that's maybe on a thread. She doesn't owe you anything. Quit expecting and quit demanding and quit thinking that she does. Quit acting like you're owed something because you went out and did this or did that. It's not how this thing works. If you want to grow up spiritually to give to your wife, and look, guys, I'm in here with you. But I hear... I live out the fact that I don't always do this. And I have been harsh. 
and I've been hurtful to the girls in my life. It's the biggest regret that I have in my life is that I've been hurtful to these ladies that I love with all my heart. It's a, it's a huge regret, and I pray that God will work around me. I pray that it'll work around you. That's what I got for today. We're, uh, we're done. We we'll pray us out. You do that. We're so thankful today for your love towards us mm. in sending your son who extended his love back to you by becoming our offering for sin. Mm. And beyond all of that, and while that would be plenty for any of us, the moment we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you put that love you and Christ into the matter of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of our life, and you sent that love, not just as a message, but as a reality of our life, the moment we believe we receive the love of God in our heart. How amazing, Father, is that? Not only that, but you sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us, who is a provider of on all occasions to produce this supernatural love of God in us apart from our flesh. This is an amazing story, Father, of your greatest gift. And here we are at Valentine's month. And we're reminded today in a great sermon on the love of God and how it differs from other loves while they are important in our life. Nothing compares to it as a God thing. I pray, pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would breathe this deep within our souls today. For it is the conduct of our life that reflects